If you're able, please stand when you hear the chimes. The Lord of hosts is with you. And also with you. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 80. If you people could read the um, bold sections. Hear us, great shepherd of Israel. Who leads your flock with justice. You sit enthroned between the cherubim. Come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face to shine upon us. That we may be saved. Do not turn away from us, Lord. Restore us, O God. Make your face to shine upon us. That we may be saved. The, our first hymn is I Need Thee. Um, if you need the music, it is number 476 in the hymn book. Otherwise, the words are in the bulletin, and we are singing verses 1 two, and four. seated. Reverend Mike and his family, Lisa and John, are up in Huntsville to a, a retreat. So today we have um, Reverend Dieter Rada back with us uh, to, to um, preach. And we welcome him again. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming. There is a, a brief <laughs> note here that Reverend Mike sent. Please greet the congregation for me tomorrow, if you see this on time, or have Susan do it. Include some of these details if you like. We are having a great retreat in Huntsville. There are 14 families and 100 people, including staff. This includes 29 kids and youth with disabilities, many of them severe. 
It is cold with two to three feet of snow. There are many activities outdoors and indoors, so the schedule is very full. It is not a resting retreat. John tried snowshoeing and tubing for the first time successfully. The Bible teaching, worship, singing, and fellowship is so good for me. I needed this for my growth, and we are learning so much about how church can and should be accessible to people with disabilities. I pray your service with Dieter is as blessed as ours is here, Reverend Mike. Looking at our, at our um, bulletin, at the announcements there, Claudette Tiller, Tiller is celebrating her birthday on the 19th of February and Wyatt Thompson on the 25th. Celebrating anniversaries in February are Wyatt and Karen Thompson on the 22nd and Michelle and Marcel Petrella on the 23rd. Again, if we do not have your um, birthday and anniversary dates, we don't need the year, just the date of the, of the occasion. It would be wonderful so that we can send, we can acknowledge in the bulletin and send, and send birthday cards. We are still looking for a treasurer for the, for the uh, board of the joint board. Condolences and prayers continue with Hazel Fallis in the Willett Hospital, Marion Kellum recovering at home from surgeries, and Tom Young at the John Noble Home. Ladies Aid and Vision Committee have a box with Yvette's picture beside it. Yvette is our World Vision girl. Um, and we've got the box out there for any loose change cash that you can spare from now until Easter, at which point it will be sent to World Vision to help her community. The soup in a jar yesterday was very successful. We completed 30 jars. Brantford Memorial Concert Band is having a concert today at 3 p.m. at Best Western in the ballroom, and the admission is by no donation. And then, Caitlin, if you could. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a long weekend this weekend, I think, for most of us. Tomorrow's family day, which means spend it with your family. Uh, we will not be meeting together for junior youth tomorrow night. Tuesday night, however, we will be meeting for kids club from 6 till 7.30. It's going to be a great night. Next Monday, however, we will be meeting for junior youth. And we'll be having our second Nintendo and Nuggets night. So junior highs, this is your chance to bring friends. We're going to play some fun video games, have a bit of a Bible teaching, and of course enjoy some chicken nuggets. So that will be from 6.30 till 8 next Monday. Also, spots are filling up slowly for our March break VBS. You'll see a big blue panel in your bulletin for that. March 13th to 16th in the afternoon, so we can all sleep in and then come here in the afternoon and have a great time together. If you have children who you think would like to participate, I'd encourage you to get them signed up. And if you have any teenagers in your life who are looking for volunteer hours, it's a great opportunity for them to come on out and help. So that's March 13th to 16th. I think that's all. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Our first Bible reading today is read by um, Reverend Dieter Retta. Well, good morning. 
It is good to be with you once again. I'd rather be here than in Huntsville. Uh, I'm sure Pastor Mike is having a wonderful time with all the others there, but how many feet of snow did you say? Two to three, no thank you. The first reading uh, is from the book of Job, chapter 42, verses one to six. And in your pew Bibles, that is page 464, 464. Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose is beyond you. You ask, who is this obscuring counsel yet lacking knowledge? But I have spoken of things which I have not understood, things too wonderful for me to know. Listen and let me speak. You said, I shall put questions to you and you must answer. I knew of you then only by report, but now I see you with my own eyes. Therefore I yield, repenting in dust and ashes. The word of the Lord. I'll find it eventually. It's marked. There we go. We got it. So our second lesson is taken from the book of James, chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Now word with all who say, today or the next day we will go off to such and such a town and spend a year there trading and making money. Yet you have no idea what tomorrow will bring. What is your life after all? You are no more than a mist, seen for a little while and then disappearing. What you ought to say is if it be the Lord's will, we shall live to do so and so. But instead you boast and brag and all such boasting is wrong. What it comes to is that anyone who knows the right thing to do and does not do it is a sinner. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading is from Mark, and Marie Brond will be reading, uh, reading it for us. It's found on page 39 in the New Testament of the Pew Bible. Good morning. So they came to Capernaum, and when he would, had gone indoors, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? They were silent because on the way they had been discussing which of them was the greatest. So he sat down, called the 12, and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must make himself last of all and servant of all. Then he took a child, sent him in front of them, and put his arms around them. Whoever receives a child like this in my name, he said, receives me, and whomever receives me receives not me, but the one who sent me. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise be to thee, O Christ. Thank you. 
if we can join together, um, the Lord's Prayer is printed in the bulletin for all of us to say in unison. Starting, Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn is uh, Because He Lives, which is printed in the bulletin, but also if you want the, the music, it's number 447, and we'll be singing verses one and three. Uh, might be a good idea to stand at this point. Kids are gonna come up? Okay, we'll stay seated. <laughs> to practice this coming up while we're still singing because we're going to do this every week from now on so don't be sorry we're just gonna get used to it so the last few weeks in Sunday school you guys have been asking me for snacks whoa he says he's hungry he didn't have breakfast whoa. well good thing I brought us some snacks today Oh, he says, yay. <laughs> All right, so I have six different snacks in my bag. Okay, I'm going to pull them out, and you guys get to pick one. Sound like a plan? Yeah. All right, so my first snack, I, hey, no peeking. No peeking. All right, my first snack, I've got a delicious, ooey, gooey Starbucks cookie. All right. And my next snack I have is a little crunchy chocolate chip cookie. So which one are we going to pick? The Starbucks cookie or my little delightful little cookie? Which one do you want, Cooper? This one? This one? Which one? They're both chocolate chip. You want this one? All right. And Jasper, which one are you after? The Starbucks cookie. Are you sure? All right. There we go. Okay, my next snack that I have available. Just, just wait to eat it, all right? We don't want to make a mess up here. I got two pieces of toast. Okay? Do they look the same? Like burnt. One is burnt and the other is 
Are you critiquing my cooking? Yes. Well, she's right. One is burnt and the other is not. Would you still eat the burnt piece of toast? They're shrugging. We'll set that aside for now. Final snack, final snack, all right? Now you're peeking. I've got two bananas. All right. How do my bananas look? Olivia, touch it. Why won't you touch it? Whoa, don't be careful. What's wrong with the banana, Cooper? It feels disgusting. Which, did I cover it in oil? No, I didn't. <laughs> Cooper, which banana would you want? He doesn't like bananas, but if you had to choose, do you want the slimy one? Are you sure? All right, you would probably pick this one, right? So, we had three similar items, one probably much more tasty than the other, right? We've got a burnt slice of toast and a perfectly golden slice of toast. We got a gross slimy banana and a pretty decent banana. And we've got a ooey gooey chocolate chip cookie and just your standard chocolate chip cookie. All right? Now, can I see these cookies for a second? Oh, Cooper. Can I see your cookie for a second? Yes, you can eat it when we go downstairs. Now, if I said, here's two cookies, your sibling gets one and you get the other. Is there gonna be a brawl over who gets the Starbucks cookie? Yes. Most likely, right? Now, what if I said, here's a Starbucks cookie and here's a standard cookie. You have to share this with somebody who hasn't had a meal today. Would your decision change? It would. So probably our decision would change, right? If somebody hasn't had a meal today, we want them to have the best. Right? They're going to get the best cookie. They're going to get the best banana. They're going to get the best slice of toast. Right? I'd probably be embarrassed to give somebody this banana. Unless it was Olivia. Maybe I'd be okay with giving it to her. But we would want to give the best to somebody who didn't have as much as us. Right? And in our Bible verse today from the Gospel of Mark, we hear Jesus encouraging us to do just that. He tells his disciples, if any man wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant to all. I think this encourages us. Jasper said he would brawl with his sister over the Starbucks cookie. Jesus' message, his encouragement to us, is to put ourselves second. Right? There's about to be a brawl up here right now. So that's what I want to encourage you of this week. Okay? Maybe at recess, instead of fighting your best friend for the best basketball or the best soccer ball, you say, yeah, you go ahead and take it. Or maybe instead of fighting with your sibling for the bigger cookie, you just give it to them, right? Maybe in the workplace, we just say, okay, you go ahead and do that. I'll let this go. Because Jesus' command to us is to put ourselves second and others first. So we're going to pray and then we're gonna go down to Sunday school. So let's repeat after me this morning. Dear God, this week, we will make choices. Some to put others first, and some to put ourselves first. Please help me choose others. Amen. the Sunday school.
across the river, I fight life's fight, no war with pain. Grace and peace be yours from Christ our Savior and from God our Father. Amen. Lord, speak to us this morning, we pray. Amen. My text this morning is from the Old Testament reading that we already have heard. Earth to earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. When these words are spoken to us or about us, we will no longer be able to hear them. They are, of course, the words of the committal service that are usually spoken at a burial. I was hesitating whether I should tell this little story because it's probably not entirely accurate, but I heard about an Anglican priest who was visiting someone of the parish who was not in the habit of attending church. And the person that he was visiting said, well, Reverend, why should I come to church? I've been there only twice. The first time you splashed cold water in my face. The second time you hitched me up with a godless woman. And then the priest interrupted him and he said, then the next time you come, we're going to throw dirt in your face and say, earth to earth. Surprising, I was surprised at this as I was studying for this. I happened to come across a little tidbit of knowledge. I didn't know this, but apparently there was a song back in the 1980s, if you can remember that far, that spoke of ashes to ashes. I don't recall that. I guess I have a different taste in music. And for a brief time between 2008 and 2010, there was also a television series by that name, Ashes to Ashes. Now the term earth to earth and dust to dust is actually much older than that. We read in Genesis chapter 18 verse 27 that Abraham had said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. And our text today in the book of Job, chapter 42 and verse 6, we read that Job despised himself and repented in dust and ashes. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Job recently, but if you have, you will know that Job had been sitting in ashes for a long time. We know all about his story and his afflictions. He was a man who had lost everything. He had lost all of his tremendous wealth. He had finally lost his health. And he finally lost the support of his friends and even the support of his wife who counseled him, why don't you just curse God and die? We read in Job chapter 2, verse 8, Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. Ashes are a powerful symbol in the Bible. And there are a couple things that, that, that ashes stands for. First of all, it stands for mortality. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, we hear that God had said to Abram and to Eve, uh, not to Abram, to Adam and to Eve, by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. It's good to remind ourselves of our mortality now and then, because I think so often, even we as Christians, tend to live as, this, as though everything will always continue the way that it was. We don't think about death unless we happen to go to a funeral or hear these words spoken to us during an Ash Wednesday service. I know that you don't have an Ash Wednesday service, but many churches do. Uh, that will be this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, which marks the beginning of Lent. So today is the last Sunday before Lent begins. Next Sunday will be the first Sunday in Lent. And Ash Wednesday is a time when people are reminded of their mortality. I experienced this once in a very powerful way. Not knowing too much about this, I uh, decided to go to a very large Anglican church in Toronto uh, for the, their Ash Wednesday service. And I took the subway there, and uh, that means I'm you know, in public transportation. That's important for my story, because in his sermon, the, uh, the, 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 the reverend, the priest, explained that we were all going to have ashes placed on our foreheads. And he said, the test of real discipleship is to not wipe that off until you get home. And I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to get into the subway with that on my forehead. So should I go forward or should I not? I can avoid this, you see. But I thought, I'm here for the experience. So when the congregation was invited to come to the altar one by one, we knelt by the altar in front of the altar, and the priest came by each individual, and he didn't give us communion. He dipped his thumb into the ashes that had been made by burning the palms of the previous year's Palm Sunday and some oil had been added to make it a little mushy and to make it stick. And then he made the sign of the cross on our foreheads. And as he did so, he said to each of us personally these words. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Wow. I don't know how you would react to that, but... I thought that was pretty powerful to hear that while I'm alive, to be reminded of that, that one day that's exactly what's going to happen to all of us. And I was quite a bit younger in those days. And when we're young, you know, we feel immortal. We feel invincible. We feel like we can take on the world. Well, death is for old people. It is, but also some young people die also. A symbol of our mortality. It is secondly also a symbol of mourning. Now in our culture, we don't mourn, do we? we uh, it used to be that people would wear black clothes. That was one of the symbols of mourning that uh, was identifying people that were going through a time of grief or Bereavement, But that's not necessarily the case anymore. I remember conducting a funeral once where the daughter of the deceased sat in the front row wearing a pink pantsuit. So black is no longer necessarily the, the uh, symbol of death. And, and we don't have external signs of mourning like maybe an armband that they used to have uh, in, in times past. We don't want to be people that grieve. In fact, we don't even want to have funerals anymore. We just have celebrations of life and then just carry on as if everything um, is normal. But in Bible times, ashes were the symbol of mourning. When someone wanted to express their grief, they would literally heap ashes on their head. They would literally put on clothes made of sackcloth. And we find 
the Bible depicting Job sitting in dust and in ashes. Job's grief for his losses are certainly understandable. And have we, if we were to experience these losses, we similarly would find ourselves grieving somehow. But our ch text changes in a moment, as we will see, that we read that Job despised himself and repented in dust and ashes. In other words, the focus of his grief had changed. It had changed from his losses to his sin. And that takes us to the third symbol of ashes in the Bible. It is a symbol of repentance. In Matthew 11, verse 21, and in Luke chapter 10, verse 13, we read about the woes that Jesus spoke to the towns of Chorazin and Bethsaida. Listen to these words of Jesus. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now, we have all at one time or another been sorrowful and, rep and filled with grief. But let me ask you this this morning. When is the last time that you were sorrowful and grieved about your sin? Let's think about that for a moment. Yes, it's, it's, it's natural to grieve when someone dies. It, it's, it's natural to grieve when you've lost everything. Is it natural to grieve about our sin? The Bible says that it is essential that we do. And many people who sin nowadays are very sorry. Oh, yes, but they're not sorry for their sin. They're sorry that they were caught. Or they're sorry about the consequences of their sin. But true remorse is not about ourselves. It is how we have offended God by our sin. You know, we live in a day and age where everyone likes to get offended about this, that, and the other. And it doesn't take a lot to, for some people to get offended. And uh, if you're on social media, you will, you will see that. And no, oh, I'm offended. Don't say that. I'm offended. Have we ever thought about how God feels about what is going on in the world today? and how God feels about some of the things that we do. And you look at any truly remorseful person, and you will note that sorrow for their sin is a true mark of true repentance. You know, my favorite example of this is in the, Bi in the Bible would be that of King David. We all know the story of King David. Here was a man who had grievously sinned, he had committed adultery out of his lust for Bathsheba. And then he committed murder by arranging the death of Bathsheba's husband. And then he went on with life as if nothing had happened. He thought he could conceal his sin. He thought he could get away with it. No one had noticed it. Until one day, God sent a man named Nathan to visit King David. And Nathan told David a little story about two men, one who was very rich and had many, many sheep, and one who was poor and had just one lamb. And the one who had many sheep had a visitor one day and needed something to cook. So rather than taking from the surplus of the many sheep that he had, what does he do? He takes the one lamb of this poor man. And the Bible says that the poor man really had clung to his sheep. In other words, that wasn't food for him. It was more like a pet. And then Nathan asked the king, what should be done with someone who committed this heinous crime? And we read in 2 Samuel chapter 12, Verse 5, that David burned with anger against the man. And he said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over. 
because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then comes the punchline of the story. Nathan lifts his gnarly finger and points to David. And he says, you are the man. Busted. Caught. He thought no one knew. But at that moment he realized, aha, I am busted. And when his great Psalm 51, he writes a psalm of remorse and says, to you only have I si against you only have I sinned. You have I offended with my sin. You know, Psalm 51 is a psalm that we occasionally ought to pray on our knees, as I have done more than once. But back to Job now. We read that Job repents in dust and ashes. What could he possibly have to repent of? Well, a few things come to mind. You remember that earlier in the book, he cursed the day of his birth. And of this, I'm sure that of this tremendous curse, he now repents. He also stated his desire to die, and maybe he repented of that. I'm sure, however, that he repented of all the complaints that he had against God. I've served you all this time. Why are you knocking me down like this? I'm sure he repented of his despair. He repented of his rash challenges of God. And according to our text, repentance puts mankind in its lowest place. All true repentance is joined with holy sorrow and self-loathing. But repentance has comfort in it because it opens up to us also the halls of joy. And if you carry on with the rest of how the book ends, you'll know that uh, God had blessed Job more at the end than he had at the beginning. Job had received a new view of God. And you know, the closer you get to God, the more you will become aware of his beauty and his holiness and our own sin. Isaiah also experienced this, as chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah reminds us how he goes and has this wonderful vision of God in the temple, the temple filled with smoke and the visions of the seraphim flying back and forth crying out, Holy! Holy, holy is God. And then he says, woe is to me, for I am of unclean lips and dwell among a people of unclean lips. He didn't think he was worthy for the job that God had for him. You know, repentance isn't something we think about a lot as Christians today. We are the product, many of us, or some of us, I shouldn't say many of us, I hope none of you are, but many people uh, in Christianity today are the product of an easy believism. Just pray a prayer, a one, two, three, an ABC, a four spiritual laws or something, and all of a sudden you have a life insurance policy for heaven. Everything is fine. Where is the word repentance in today's proclamation of the gospel? We certainly find it in the book of Acts, where in the early days of the church, the apostles preached that God has, has commanded, not suggested, but commanded people everywhere to repent. What should we do, they asked him. They asked Peter on the day of Pentecost. And what did he say? Oh, just bow your head and repeat a short prayer after me? No. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Now, the baptism part, we, we, we've got that. We've retained that over the centuries. But have we included repentance? And when we do think of repentance on the rare occasion that we do, 
So often our thoughts go to the evil persons outside of the church, the criminals and the people who openly, defiantly break God's moral laws, the ones who murder and, and, and commit adultery and all these other vile things. They need to repent, right? Yes, they do. But what about the sins that are committed inside the church? You'll be happy to know that I'm not going to go into the sins in this church because I don't know you, but I'm sure that there are. And I'm reminded very much of a preacher who did dare to talk about the sins in his congregation and the elders had a meeting and they called him in one day and he said, you know what, uh, Reverend, we don't mind you talking about the sins of Abraham, Jacob and Isaac but leave ours alone, will you? Well, we can leave them alone, but I can tell you this, God won't. What are some of the sins committed inside the church? Well, you figure that out. I'm sure that you can and that you will. And I wanna just close with a, with a very brief definition of what repentance really is. It, it, it sounds like an awfully heavy concept, but it isn't. Repentance means no less and no more than a U-turn. A U-turn in our life, where once we've been going in one direction of wrong and we stop it, we turn around and we begin to walk in the ways of righteousness. That is what repentance is. But let's start with something else, you know, baby steps. When is the last time that you changed your mind about anything? I have met people, because I've been a pastor for many, uh, for several decades, and uh, in one church I was there for, for uh, 13 years, and so I knew them quite well. And I knew people in that congregation who in those 13 years had not changed their mind about anything, anything. I mean, you couldn't, have a, you couldn't have a, even have a discussion with them because if you had a discussion with them, they would say, well, I've always seen it this way. And that's supposed to prove something? You've always seen it that way? What if you've been wrong all of these years? And uh, I found a, a positive example of this once in Parliament, of all places where someone got up and made a statement of something or other, and someone from the opposition got up and said, ah, but you're on the record as having said this and this two years ago, completely the opposite, to which the member retorted, is it against the law to learn something and to change one's mind about something? Oh, I wish a lot of our politicians would change their mind about a lot of things. A lot of repentance would do well in all houses of government and parliament. And a lot of repentance and a lot of changing our mind would do well in a lot of churches also. Why? Because dust we are. And to the dust we shall return. Amen. Now let us all pray. Eternal God and our Father, we come to you this morning and we confess that we have sinned. We have grievously offended you in many ways. Some of us have done it only in our thoughts. We have imagined horrible things that are contrary to your will, but which we have longed to do. And yet we have done it because Jesus said we can commit adultery in our hearts without actually doing the, the act. We have sinned by the things that we've said to one another that were unloving, things that tore down rather than to build up, we have sinned before you by the things we have done, but also the things that we have left undone. We have sinned. 
And we have no excuse. And we have no plea to make except thy blood, the blood of your son who died and shed his precious blood to pay and atone for all of those sins. Help us, Lord, to find our way to repentance. Lord, I thank you for this congregation and its witness here in this community. I pray for those who are part of this fellowship who are going through difficult times at the moment, those who are ill, and their names were mentioned earlier in the service, those who are being challenged. We pray for those who are missionaries that have been sent and supported by this church, that they would find blessing in their labors. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us this week, this week, to be your faithful servants, to be salt and light in Brantford or wherever else you have called us to be. We thank you that you've blessed us also with material things that we offer back to you as tithes and offerings. May they be well received and accepted by you. We pray these things in the, Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. And we lift up all those unspoken things that people have on their hearts here this morning. And everyone said, Amen. For those who have, who have um, brought offerings with them today, there are offering plates at both doors. Um, if you contribute electronically, thank you very much. And we'll listen to um, Derek play his offertory at this time in his name.
please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Our last hymn today is The Lord is My Shepherd. It's found in number 86 if you need the music. And we are singing five verses. now in peace to love and serve the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. <laughs>